everybody teases, but everybody likes bathrooms, right? <laughs> um, I've had fun researching this. My talk was way, way long, so I had to chop it. So if you want more information, just let me know. Um, but um, so bathrooms um, that we have in our homes are legacies of European colonization around the world. Its current form dates back millennia and would not have been possible without the evolution of um, basic sanitation. Well, I guess if I point the right thing, sorry. Um, the earliest recorded civilizations are known as hydraulic civilizations. They developed along watersheds and close to large rivers. In Egypt, for example, the control and frequency of the Nile River allowed an irrigation sense system and construction of dikes and piped water that supplied the palace. In ancient Babylonian, there were records of water and sewage networks since about 3000 BC. Cleanliness is both a physical and spiritual state, so the first known bathtub or basin was a ritual pool where people cleansed themselves before worshiping, getting both their bodies and spirits clean. In the third millennial BC, indoor plumbing had been invented for both bathing and sanitation. The earliest known bathtub was found in Greece, dating from 1700 BC. Excavation of Greek cities had found alabaster and ceramic tubs, as well as hot and cold water systems that provided indoor plumbing for the bathers. <coughs> um, we are more familiar with ancient Roman baths, like you see here, um, for them, both the bath and the latrines were places of civilization or socialization. Um, the bathroom was communal, sitting side by side. So can you imagine, you know, there's like a, like a whole, whole row next to each other. <laughs> um, the Roman civilization developed sewage and supply systems that made possible the growth of its empire. Latrine waste was collected and taken to, yes, there it is. Um, the Klaukau Maxima, in parallel with the system, large aqueducts collected water from rivers, transported it to urban centers, supplying cities with clean water. And so um, you can see the top shows how the Roman was and what it actually um, is today, but very ingenious to be able to do that at the time period. From the fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of Christianity, and the feudal system, the conception change in sanitary conditions declined. Depending on where you were and who you were, bathing in during the Middle Ages could be enjoyed or condemned, and as time went on, public bathing, especially in mixed company, was seen more as a sinful behavior, and baths came indoors or stopped completely. During the Middle Ages and part of the modern age, there was no construction of sewage or supply networks, while um, hygiene practices, practices were on an individual basis. As plague spread, public bathing stopped as people thought that bathing with others would cause the plague to enter through the stench of the steamy hot water. This continued throughout the Renaissance. As time passed, steam baths replaced soaking baths, and for the wealthy, perfumes became the bath of choice. Throughout centuries and cultures, Herbs, flowers, salts, and scented oils were used to make baths more fragrant and to help clean the body. Soap was in use by the Romans, the Gauls, and the Celts, but the use stopped for several centuries. Most European and Central European countries didn't see soap again until the 1500s. Soap at that time was made of animal fats, lye, and ashes that could peel your flesh. Scented soaps did not appear until the 16th and 17th centuries, and the formulas and recipes were fine, for the fine scented soaps were a well-guarded secret, keeping prices up so that those wealthy soaps were just meant for the rich. Bathing is only half of the equation in a bathroom. Eliminating waste is the other. So most medieval castles or wealthy homes had guard robes, um, privacy rooms and closets where waste materials fell into a pit or into a body of water. As in here. Um, those that didn't have these rooms um, often dumped their waste from chamber pots into the streets. 
So can you imagine walking past and, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but um, it's not a wonder um, that we all didn't die of the plague, but the night soul men helped um, this not to be the case. These individuals cleaned both animal and human waste from the streets and alleys and carted it out of town. Outside of London, one pile was seven and a half acres wide, and it was called Mount Pleasant. <laughs> Um, as time went through the centuries, the wealthy in Europe began to once again embrace the bathtub. By the 17th century, when Europeans began settling in North America in large numbers, the bathtub for your average home was a portable tub made of wood lined with steel. It was brought out before the fire or hearth and filled with heated water. The whole family would take turns bathing in the same water, which then only would be damped. There was a tub stored in the pantry and a chamber pot underneath every bed and a privy out back. This would not change until indoor plumbing in the 1850s. The latrine wasn't improved until the 18th century while the flush toilet appeared in England while the baguette appeared in France in the same century. The shower, on the other hand, has records since the Egyptian civilization but its invention as we know it today is also dated to the 18th century. Bathrooms as we know them now took about five centuries to become popular. This development would not be possible if it wasn't for the development of common sewage and supply networks to systems in cities. The first recognized system was installed in London in the second half of the 19th century after the cholera epidemic. Most sewage systems began in the decades following the Civil War, which was often laid out in piecemeal fashion, so sewage from one neighborhood might contaminate the water supply to another. The increase in population and recurring epidemics of cholera and typhoid spurred the sanitation movement and accepted Louis Pasteur's germ theory of disease by the end of the 19th century. The integrated sewer systems and filtered chlorinated water was adapted in most major American cities. America was the best plum nation in the world during the early 20th century, and by 1940, 93.5% of all European dwellings had running water, 83% had indoor toilets, and 77.5% had bathroom facilities. These advances were a combined result of sanitation's demands for improved municipal water and sewage systems, as well as manufacturing techniques by companies like Standard and Mott. Now, before 1850, the three parts of the bathrooms were in separate rooms. If you needed to wash up, you only needed a basin and a container of water. If you were middle class or wealthy, you had a wash basin or a wash stand in your bedroom. The wealthy may have had a luxury of a tub in one's chambers, but for the rest, it was primarily <clears throat> the family basin in the kitchen. By the mid-1800s, the connection between waste and health had finally been made in London, Paris, and New York, and they began to build elaborate sewer systems to flush the waste from the city. Um, American architects began including bathrooms and water closets in better homes in the middle of the 19th century. With knowledge comes technology, and with great technology advances of the industrial age, that brought many, um, too many people and too, many, uh, too much waste to relatively small spaces. So the solution was modern plumbing and the flush toilet. So many people that think that Thomas Crapper invented the flush toilet, which is not true. Um, in fact, the famed Victorian plumber doesn't even get credit for the term crap. Um, that was wrong long before he even showed up. Um, the first flush toilet was actually invented by Queen Elizabeth's the first um, godson, Sir John Harrington, in 1596. Harrington's self-described -descri privy imperfection was a noisy valved um, device called the Ajax. It worked well enough that Elizabeth allegedly installed one, but to his peers, they literally turned their nose up at it because um, the bowl basin, or the, the, the bowl washed straight into a cesspool below, so the stench outweighed the contraption's convenience. 
So Harrington's improvement at the toilet um, without a sewer is just a gigantic chamber pot. In, in 1775, the first patent for the flush toilet was awarded to the British inventor Alexander Cumming. He and another inventor, Samuel Prozer, in 1777, made great strides in figuring out the modern toilet. But there still wasn't really any way to hook up um, to a water source or a waste pipe system. It would nearly be 300 years before the inventive subjects of a different queen, Queen Elizabeth, finally got handle on Harrington's ideas. In 1880, working toilets were welled, or wed to working sewers and the world was changed forever. Um, forget antibiotics, steam engines, central heat and electric light, flushing toilets and sewer systems are arguably the most important inventions of the 19th century. But still, um, it wasn't a toilet. It's a water closet, so-called because early indoor privies were often put under the stairs in a closet. By the 17, 1870s, most people either used a hole in the ground or a chamber pot. The toilet was just a dressing table or a wash stand, a meaning that eventually was adapted instead of using the term water closet. Also in 1870, there were attempts to replace water closets with mechanical parts that controlled the flushing action, such as the pan, valve, and plunger types. The new designs in which the action of the water alone flushed the toilet and created a seal against the sewered gas. In 1880s, the earliest flush water closets were made to resemble chamber pots and commodes. In fact, entire bathroom suites like you see here were elaborate encased and carved and stained in woodwork that was closer to a parlor than your privy. These great bathroom suites of the Gilded Aid mansions were quite over the type, but not um, the easiest to maintain. By the late 1880s, one um, open plumbing was becoming more popular with porcelain fixtures in full view. Of course, the Victorians did what they did best. They covered them with intricate um, embossing, glazing, and decorative um, gilded decorations. <clears throat> by 1900 and 1910, the earliest washout closets were replaced by more efficient wash down and siphon jet models. High tanks transitioned to low tanks, and ornamentation virtually disappeared in favor of smooth white sanitary systems. By 1910, toilets had pretty much arrived in form and function not too far from today's. A one-piece vitreous china toilet appeared in 1922. Economic pressures during the Great Depression made the new, more uh, affordable um, closed coupling two-piece model popular with the same freestanding two 12 inch rough and toilet that we use today. The first flush toilet in the US, does anybody know where those were at? They were actually in hotels. Um, in 1829, the Tremont Hotel in Boston was the first hotel to have indoor plumbing with eight water closets built by architect um, Elijah Rogers. They were on the ground floor of the hotel and were powered by a water storage system on the roof gravity fed to the flush the toilets into the sewer system. It was simple, but it worked. There was still the problem of backflow or sewer gases and methane. This would take a few more years, but the idea of the modern toilet was almost there. By 1834, Rogers surpassed himself by designing the Astor House in Manhattan, a large six-story building with no elevators yet, with 17 bathrooms on the top floors, which served 300 guests. In addition to water closets, baths with running water were also available. These bathtubs had little gas furnaces and tanks attached to the side or above, which would heat the water. Both the water closet and the bath drained into the sewer system and were filled with huge water tanks on the roof. Finally, someone figured out how to deliver pressurized water that had significant power to flush waste into a system of pipes that led outside the house to the sewer. Now, Englishman Thomas Crapper does give the credit to this. The person who gets the credit for the, the modern 
um, the invention of the modern toilet is Thomas Typhoid. In 1885, he invented a valveless toilet made of vitreous china. Previous models have been made of wood and metal. Thomas Crapper owned a plumbing supply company and he bought the patent for the silent valveless water waste preventer and began making toilets. The slang phrase in the crapper does come from his name. It was brought um, to the United States by American soldiers after World War I after seeing crapper's, crapper's name all over the toilets in the UK, which you can see it's literally everywhere. Um, Vitreous china became the preferred material, perfect for both cleanliness and the possibilities of design. They also worked out the details in sinks and bathtubs and the fixtures that would actually deliver water. What we know now as a modern bathroom all came together in the late 1800s. The city sewer systems, central heating, hot and cold running water, and the perfection of indoor plumbing and pipes the invention of the flush toilet and the invention of sanitary bathtub and sinks um, had the realization that all these things could be best utilized in one room and a new social programming programs promoted personal cleanliness and hygiene gave us the bathroom. Money in manufacturing was easy to come by and soon hundreds of companies were, turned, were turning out all kinds of new things for bathrooms. These new companies, many which are still in business, started in the second half of the 1800s. The earliest Victorian bath tubs were not claw foot tubs, as most people think. They were oval tubs, some with wooden rims, um, some made with zinc, tin, or copper, and the insert into the wooden casings. But this was all about to change. Take Kohler, for example, one of the largest makers of toilets, tubs, and sinks. They started in 1873, when an Austrian immigrant named John Michael Kohler bought the Sheboygan Union Iron and Steam Foundry. They were making farm implements and castings for ornamental, ornamental fences, urns, and cemetery crosses. But in 1883, Kohler had the idea to bake an enamel coating to one of his pig scholars, and the idea of enamel cast iron tubs came about and the first Kohler bathtub was born. The Standard Sanitizing Sanitary Manufacturing Company, founded in 1875, was a small um, company making plumbing fixtures. In 1899, they merged with several other um, similar companies and became the foremost makers of plumbing fixtures, bringing such innovations such as hot and cold water mixes, the one-piece toilet, and the corrosion-free bath plumbing fixtures. <coughs> Um, by 1929, they were the largest maker of bathroom fixtures. They became American Standard in 1967 after a merge with the American Radiator Company. Other manufacturers soon followed, and by 1885, the cast iron clawfoot tub was the tub of choice for the Victorian bathroom. It would last until the 1920s, or unless you're Joy and she puts one in her house. <laughs> um, um, then the double walled enamel tub became the next best thing. By the time the installation of shower heads and shower curtain rods added to the tub, half tub enclosures that came up like a clamshell around one end of the bathtub with shower heads had its run of popularity as well. In wealthier homes, the toilet was often in a room by itself or usually on the bedroom floor above the parlor room away from the public rooms of the house. Many houses had servant toilets off the kitchen or often outside in the shed or in the attic. Now, the bathroom usually had wainscoting made either of tile or beadboard. As the Victorian age moved into towards the 20th century, tile became the wall covering of choice because it was relatively easy to clean, making the bathroom much more sanitary than ever before. Often the tiles were matched with decorative bands of color or embossed tiles to pastel colors as accents. In the homes of the rich, a combination of tile and white marble was often used with wall panels of marble, marble sinks, and even marble floors. The toilet is, was often a marble slab, as was the tub. If there was a separate shower cubicle, it would be marble or tile. 
or in middle class homes, unglazed white tile, often hex tiles or square tiles, sometimes with black accent tiles, was the material of choice for bathroom floors. By World War I, the bathroom of an average American looked very similar to the average bathroom of homes today. Every new home was fitted with at least one bathroom. The manufacturers of bathrooms provided such fixtures um, with fixtures, tiles, lighting, accessories, and plumbing um, fixtures. They got creative and gave customers uh, more variety to choose for their ideal bathroom. America was uh, absolutely obsessed with bathrooms. The typical bathroom around this time consisted of a toilet, an attached tank, porcelain sink, often wall mounted, and a bathtub with a wall mounted shower attachment. Shower curtains kept the water from pooling on the tile floor. 1914 catalog for the JL Mott Ironworks, they had three um, types of bathrooms that you could get depending on your budget. <clears throat> so this first one, um, is the Pan American. This is your top tier bathroom. So it consisted of a porcelain double shell tub, shower, a seat bath, a pedestal sink, and a siphonic jet toilet. This all came for the lovely price of $873.05. But if you didn't want to spend that much, you could go to the mid-grade. And so this is the Everett. It consisted of a cast iron tub without feet, but enameled on the inside, but painted on the outside. A porcelain sink attached to the wall and rested on a single leg and a siphonic jet toilet. Its price is $150.25. But if that still was a little more than what you wanted, you could go for the economic. So this was your old fashioned footed bathtub, a tubular shower, enameled sink attached to the wall and a wash down toilet. This was at $92.75, which is a bargain today. <laughs> um, while tile bathrooms were seen very sanitary, uh, but by the 1920s it became popular to start having wallpaper and pattern in your bathroom, taking them from a clinical examining room to a more feminine, family-friendly space. By this time, the Victorian clawfoot tub was going out of style, which was often criticized for its housekeeping issue. First came the bathtub with the solid pedestal base, and then came the two-sided enclosed tub resting on the floor. No more worries about cleaning under the tub. By 1935, standard sales brochure only had one um, footed bathtub in it. The shower, which was more of a novelty than a necessary, was becoming more popular. The shower is quicker and easier than a bath, and by the 1930s, every middle class home and above had a shower. The next fix, um, feature that was introduced was the use of color for bathroom fixtures. Um, the Universal Sanitary Manufacturing Company in Newcastle, Pennsylvania is credited for pioneering color in sanitary wares in 1926. But in 1927, Kohler Company followed by introducing the bathroom set, matching sinks, toilets, and tubs. And they offered six colors, which you see here. So you have autumn brown, lavender, spring green, old ivy, west point gray, and horizon blue. The dark colors were especially popular in the 20s and 30s, and then lighter colors later in the 50s and 60s. So how many remember those lovely, you know, uh, colored tiles all over? Um, the modern area would mean something for every income bracket, offering a large variety of projects. Um, the ensuite system and the master bathroom became popular. As the housing boom of the post-World War II generation continued, it was no longer acceptable to have only one bathroom, or a full bathroom, that is. A powder room was needed for downstairs for the guests, which included a toilet and a sink. A proper master bath had everything, a bath, a tub, a separate shower stall, toilet, and a double sink. And some larger bathrooms had a separate toilet cubicle. Um, there were also shower rooms, um, which um, is a bathroom with only a shower, 
And we can't forget about the Jack and Jill bathroom, like the one, um, well, the one that has two doors to, accessible, to be accessible to two rooms, like we have in Ruth Muir. And here's one from the Mott's um, catalog. Um, the modern era has seen the use of all kinds of materials for bathroom features. Cast iron has been replaced by acrylic and fiberglass. Even Victorian clawfoot designs are back. Jacuzzis, whirlpool tubs, and massage baths uh, make cleanliness an experience. Sinks have gone from white vitreous china or enamel porcelain to glass, metal, stone, um, vessel sitting on top of a table. Pretty much anything that can hold water has become a bath, um, a tub or a sink. Same with tile. People are replacing that with all kinds of stones, metal, and coated surfaces. Fixtures have changed as well. Um, with all kinds of shapes and materials and manageable from vintage Victorian to ultra modern. Toilets are now stage devices hanging from the walls or perched like sculpted objects. And showers can be hung, double hung, um, and be in triple size spaces with hundreds of directional jets and overhead waterfalls of the shower. <laughs>